morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the first of a planned series of talks supported by NTU School of Humanities, Singapore Studies Research Cluster. I'm Shara Julili, an Assistant Professor of English here at NTU School of Humanities. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly mention that this session is being recorded. Also, a quick reminder for everyone to ensure your mics are turned off for the duration of the talk. We welcome you to join the conversation during the Q&A afterwards. You're also welcome to type your question into the chat box during the talk. You can type it to the group or send it to me in a direct message on the chat box if you prefer. By default, I'll mention who the question is from. So if you prefer not to have your name mentioned, please do let me know as well. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Gui Wei Sin from the University of California, Riverside, to speak to us today. Dr. Gui is the author of National Consciousness and Literary Cosmopolitics and the editor of Common Lines and City Spaces. This is an essay collection on Singaporean poet Arthur Yap. He also co-edited a 2016 special issue of the journal Interventions about Singapore literature and culture. Notable among his numerous publications about Southeast Asian literature um, is his essay on contemporary literature from Singapore in the online Oxford Research Encyclopedia for Literature as well as a chapter on narrating the global Southeast Asia Asian diaspora in volume 10 of the Oxford History of the Novel in English. Dr. Gui's talk today is titled Gender Identity and Representation in Yo Hui Xuan's Dreamwalker Comic. I will now pass the time over to Dr. Gui. Dr. Gui, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now proceed to share my screen as I do have some slides prepared. Okay. Okay, I hope you can all see my slides. Excellent. Okay, uh, before I begin my talk, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of California at Riverside, where I work, is located on the lands of the Kawia, Tongva, Dusenyo, and Serrano peoples. I am grateful to and recognize my responsibility to the original, current, and future caretakers of these lands, water, and air. My thanks also to my academic colleagues, Cheryl Julia Lee and Wei Wan Ling uh, from NTU's English department for organizing and hosting this event. And my thanks also to the Singapore Studies Research Cluster and the School of, U of Humanities at uh, NTU for their support. So my talk today is about the comic Dreamwalker uh, and the Chinese title is Meng Xingzhe. And this comic is authored by Yo Hui Xuan and started publication in 2009 and is still ongoing. So Dreamwalker currently has three series published by TCZ Studios and the author is working on a fourth series right now. And I'm going to be reading Dreamwalker as a Singaporean comic that adapts Japanese Maho Shoujo or Magical Girl manga and references important tropes from these Magical Girl manga. And I'm interested in how Dreamwalker's manga-esque tropes represent and raise questions about gender, identity, and social relationships in contemporary Singapore. So here is the outline of my talk. I'm going to be sort of, uh, uh, sort of doing a kind of literature review, right, to explain the terms global manga and manga-esque and what these terms mean. I'm going to briefly talk about scholarship and criticism about manga in Southeast Asia and Singapore. Right, and then also uh, go uh, a bit into uh, scholarship and academic criticism about Maho Shoujo, about magical girl, uh, magical girl figure in uh, manga and anime, and then I'll be talking about Dreamwalker itself. Uh, I do want to say a few things uh, before I begin my talk uh, to uh, for context and clarity. Uh, first of all, there will be spoilers, right? Not just spoilers for Dreamwalker, but also for some other comics and manga and anime I'm going to refer to along the way. So you've all been warned. And although Dreamwalker has three published series, my focus will be on the first series, which consists of two story arcs. Also, you may notice that I don't actually refer to Dreamwalker as a manga, uh, even though its visual and artistic style is very similar to Japanese manga. Let me explain. Uh, on the publisher's website, and also in the liner notes for the physical volumes, the, the, the paperback volumes of Dreamwalker, right, uh, Dreamwalker is referred to as a comic, as comics, rather than as manga. And the author, Yo Hui Xuan, describes herself as Singapore's first full-time comics artist. 
So I'm respecting the terms used by the publisher and the creator and referring to Dreamwalker as comics, right? Even though I think we'd all agree, it's definitely inspired by Japanese manga. And I'm also discussing it in the context of global manga and manga-esque studies. And what do I mean by global manga and manga-esque? I'll, I'll explain in a little bit, right? Just bear with me. Uh, and finally, Dreamwalker is published in both uh, Chinese and English, but I'm working with the English ver uh, version because I first bought the series. I bought the first series as ebooks on Google Play, and those are only in English. So I stuck with the English version when I bought the second and third series as paperback hard copies. So I'm going to be ref referring to the characters in the comics uh, by their names in the English version, right? which actually makes sense as I'm discussing the comic in relation to global or original non-Japanese manga. So I'm now going to do a bit of scholarship or literature review uh, and explain what I mean by these two terms, global manga and the manga-esque. So these two ideas were introduced by comic scholars uh, as a way of re-examining what Zoltan Kashuk calls uh, the manga, the what is manga problematic. Right. In his essay, Zoltan Kashuk highlights the tensions and overlaps between two important definitions of what manga is. So on the one hand, you have the manga as style camp, and on the other hand, you have those who say manga is made in Japan. As their names imply, the manga as style camp would argue that what makes something manga is the adherence, the use right, of a particular visual style or aesthetics. While those who think of manga as made in Japan argue that manga needs to be connected in some way, shape or form to Japan, right, whether in terms of authorship, readership, publication or language or culture. To widen the field of discussion between these two camps or poles, another critic, a sociologist, Casey Brianza, coined the term global manga, which includes what are often known as OEL, original English language, or ONJ, original non-Japanese manga. Brianza, who, edi uh, who edited an essay collection on global manga, defines global manga as, quote, published sequential art, uh, published sequential art products that producers and consumers might call manga, and that can be produced without any direct creative input at all from Japan. So a work of global manga has incorporated requisite cultural meanings and practices from Japanese manga, but does not otherwise require any Japanese individual or collective entity in a material or productive capacity. Adopting a similar approach, separating manga from direct connections with Japan, another comic studies scholar, Jacqueline Burnt, coins the term manga-esque. And Burnt uses the manga-esque uh, manga this, this idea to acknowledge the negative connotations that people often have regarding manga and comics in general. Right? So they might often think of manga and comics as infantile, lightweight, biased, or overly spectacular or dramatic. But Byrne's idea of the manga-esque also includes the affirmative or positive aspects of manga, uh, which you can see in the quotation at the bottom of the slide, right? An emphasis on sharing instead of distinction or division, an emphasis on empathy and self-confirmation instead of critical questioning, on affective or emotional rather than political engagement. In another essay, Jacqueline Burnt also talks about how manga's reliance on simplification instead of complexity and conventionalization instead of realism and authenticity can actually generate inconsistencies in manga's depiction of our reality and our everyday world. And these perceived inconsistencies may also be treated as a chance to undermine ideological claims and representational messages in favor of a different kind of complexity, end quote. So why have I spent so much time talking about global manga and the manga-esque, these two concepts and ideas? Well, Casey Brianza's idea of global manga right, moves away from debates about manga's authenticity. So we don't have to keep arguing about whether or not a work that looks visually like manga, but isn't written in Japanese or created by a Japanese author is really manga or not. Instead, global manga looks at what uh, at, at any sequential work of art that's called manga by its author or publisher within what sociologists call a field of cultural production. How does a work that's called manga stand in relation to other works also called manga inside of and outside of Japan?
And how does calling something manga distinguish it from other types of comics and visual art in a particular country or society, like in Singapore? As for the manga-esque, Jacqueline Burns' acknowledgement that manga is often dismissed as being infantile or lightweight may actually be advantages in two related ways. First, manga may appear simple, but it's not simplistic or childish. As Burn points out, although manga may not offer direct, straightforward criticism or social commentary, it can say something about our society through its emphasis on sharing, uh, empathy, self-confirmation, and emotional and affective engagement. Second, reading a comic as a manga-esque text means paying attention to how it borrows and tweaks various tropes and conventions from established manga subgenres. In other words, if I'm reading Dreamwalker as a manga-esque comic from Singapore, I'm going to pay attention to how the comic borrows from and tweaks the Maho Shoujo, the magical girl, girl subgenre. And because Dreamwalker does take place in a kind of oniric or dreamlike version of contemporary Singapore, we can also ask how these manga-esque tropes and conventions may offer commentary or alternative perspectives on various kinds of identities and relationships that may be erased or neglected by the status quo. So now I'm going to move from global manga and manga-esque uh, ideas and concepts to a quick summary of how manga has been localized, right, or domesticated or localized in Southeast Asia and Singapore. And here I'm drawing on the work of scholars such as Ng Wai Ming, who have written extensive histories about manga's uh, publication and circulation in East Asia and Southeast Asia. So to summarize, right, Japanese manga became popular in Southeast Asian countries around about the 19, you know, mid 1970s and 1980s, right, in places like the Philippines and Malaysia and Singapore, right, uh, and a lot of manga in the 1980s were pirated Chinese editions brought in from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, but it wasn't until the late 1990s and early 2000s that original non-Japanese manga-esque or global manga works began appearing in Southeast Asia, in countries like Thailand, like the Philippines, and of course, Malaysia and Singapore. In the handful of essays that have been published about Southeast Asian global manga, two important points stand out. First, the globalization or the, the, the domestication of manga has encouraged more women artists and authors to create original work in the Southeast Asian comic scene that has traditionally been male dominated. Second, manga's works from Southeast Asia are often read as reflecting or expressing the hybridity or the mixing of cultures and peoples and languages in ways that stand out from official narrat uh, national narratives or identities. So to use an example, which you can see on the slide, right? Uh, take the Philippines, for example. Uh, Carl Ian Cheng Chua and Christine Michelle Santos have written an essay arguing that manga from the Philippines, known locally as Pinoy manga, stands apart from Philippine comics, comics with a K, that is heavily influenced by American comics and that hyper-realistic visual style, which you're all familiar with if you think about you know, DC and Marvel superheroes, right? Batman, Superman, right? Green Lantern. So there's a tension between Philippine comics and Pinoy manga, and that can be read as a contest over national identity. Some critics in the Philippines see Pinoy manga because of its Japanese influence as an affront, as a kind of departure or even an insult to Filipino nationalism because, they argue, the first Filipino comics artist was none other than their great national hero, Jose Rizal. Right, there's that argument to be made. On the other hand, supporters or proponents of Pinoy manga, like Chua and Santos, argue that what local manga-esque works reflect is not some unchanging or essential national identity, but instead the Philippines, quote, post-colonial struggle as it tries to continue to shape its own distinctive identity as a nation, end quote. Then they return to Malaysia, right? Uh, critic Gan Xiu Hui argues that a Malaysian manga artist who uses the pen name of Kauru is able to create a local identity in her shoujo manga that has cross-ethnic appeal because Kauru writes her manga first in Bahasa or in Malay and then gets it translated into English and Chinese. As Gan argues uh, in her essay, Manga in Malaysia, Kaoru's manga includes visual and physical details that only slightly refer to Malaysia. 
And these references are used by the author to create a sense of familiarity without generating too strong a sense of locality. This means that Kaoru's manga can, quote, provide a space, of, uh, a space that's relatively free of ethnic tensions in everyday life in Malaysia. And, Dan suggests, manga's cross-ethnic appeal might, uh, might offer an alternative venue or route for improving ethnic and race relations in Malaysia. So my detour into these two essays about uh, Philippines and Malaysian global manga is to illustrate how Jacqueline Byrne's concept of the manga-esque can apply to our interpretation of Southeast Asian comics. What I mean to say is that manga-esque comics may appear simple and formulaic, but they can become sites of contention about national culture and, ident and, uh, and identity, right, in the case of the Philippines, and also potential spaces of community and interaction, uh, interaction right, in, as in the case of Malaysia. Now, if you look at Singapore, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any specific scholarly discussion about manga-esque or global manga uh, comics by Singaporean creators. Uh, a few uh, authors come to mind, right, uh, who, who, who are uh, manga-esque comics artists from Singapore. Uh, Evangeline Neo, Fu Sui Chen, or FSC, and uh, Hu Jing Xuan. And you can see the, the cover of some of their books on the right-hand side of the slide. My uh, colleague Lim Cheng Ju, who works on comics in Singapore and Southeast Asia, observes that the mainstream trend in Singaporean comics has mainly been life writing. And by life writing, I mean autobiography or memoir or biography. Basically, stories based on the lives of real or fictionalized people. And examples that Lim Cheng Ju uh, gives in his uh, essay, uh, Current Trends in Singapore Comics, would be uh, Troy Chin's Resident Tourist, uh, Oh Yong Hui and Ko Hong Ting's Ten Sticks, One Rice, right, about a satay seller, uh, and Sunny Liu's Eisner Award -win uh, winning The Art of Charlie Chan Hong Chai. However, in another essay, Lim Cheng Ju also points out that stories by female Southeast Asian comics artists over the past decade, over the past 10 years, have begun combining personal issues with broader political concerns. And here I want to offer a caveat, right? By politics and the political, I'm not just referring to the government or political parties or the color of your polo t-shirt. Polit politics in a broader sense means being aware of and thinking about power structures and relationships that affect us as individuals and as groups and communities. And it also means considering what kinds of power we may have as individuals or as groups to question or change these power structures and relationships. So to go back to what Lim Cheng Ju was saying about, you know, life writing as a mainstream trend in Singapore comics, and also the combination of personal and political concerns in Southeast Asian comics by women creators, right? Uh, this is important to my discussion of Dreamwalker, because Dreamwalker is a manga-esque story centered on a magical girl whose personal everyday life becomes part of a larger power struggle in reality and in the dream world. To better understand the significance of the magical girl, I'm going to briefly discuss some critical scholarship about Maho Shoujo, right, about uh, uh, magical girls. And this is where I'm just going to pause for a bit. I've talked for about, you know, 15, 16 minutes. And I want to ask you, the audience, when, uh, when we think of Maho Shoujo, magical girls, which characters come to mind? If you can just type in the chat, magical girls, Maho Shoujo. Mm. It's also a chance for me to <laughs> take a sip of water. That's right. Can't get the Sakura, right? That's right. Uh, Sailor Moon, yes. Uh, Fighting Evil by Moonlight since 1991. Uh, Magical Night, Magical Night Ray Earth, yes, yes. Madoka, yes. Uh, Puella Magic, uh, Puella Meichai Madoka Magica, right? Madoka, that's an anime series that is. Uh, Heartbreaking <laughs> in a certain way, uplifting, but also heartbreaking. I see lots of Sailor Moon coming up uh, in the chat. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think there was a re in North America, there was a reissue of the, uh, the English, trans a new translation or an updated translation that was published in 20, uh, 2012 or 2011. Yes. Yeah, so I see Card Captain Sakura, right? Sailor Moon, uh, Maruka, Magic Knight, Ray Earth, wonderful. Uh, pretty, yes, Pretty Cure as well. That's great. Yes, yes. Uh, I would say that in my my brief time studying 
academic scholarship on magical girls in uh, manga and anime, the top hits, right, uh, are Sailor Moon uh, and, uh, and Madoka, right, with uh, Count Captain Sakura and the other magical girl uh, characters, a distant third or fourth or fifth. Uh, and there's a reason for this, uh, so this uh, intense fascination and interest uh, uh, regarding Sailor Moon in the North American Academy, which I'll explain in a bit. But thank you for your responses. Let me move to my next slide. Right. So as uh, you can see in the response uh, uh, that on the slide, I've actually sort of highlighted, spotlighted three of the Magical Girl series of characters that you named in the chat, right? Sailor Moon, Magic Knight Ray Earth uh, by Clamp, and also Cut Captain Sakura, right, by, uh, by Clamp as well. So the Maho Shoujo, or Magical Girl, as her name implies, is the young girl who has magical or supernatural powers. As manga and anime scholar Susan Napier points out, the term shoujo, right, originally referred to girls around the ages of 12 and 13. But, quote, over the last couple of decades, the term, has be the term shoujo has become a, a short hat, right, for a certain kind of liminal or in-between identity between child and adult, end quote. Now, to my knowledge, the most in-depth historical study of the Maho Shoujo, the magical girl, is by critic Saito Kumiko, who observes that the magical girl emerged in Japanese anime and manga in around the 1960s and 70s, right? And often these uh, narratives would feature, quote, a nine to 14 year old ordinary girl who accidentally acquires supernatural power. And when the, when the girl, the ordinary girl invokes or, you know, uh, 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 summons the magical power, she goes through a transformation or metamorphosis, often into a more adult or physically grown up version of herself. Saito also argues that the stories of magical girls from the 1970s often, quote, revolve around the magical freedom of adolescence, of teenagehood, right, prior to the gendered stage of marriage and motherhood suggesting the difficulty of imagining elements of power and defiance beyond the point of marriage. So the magical girls from this earlier period, from the 1970s, often had to give up their magical powers when they stopped being tweens or teenagers and started making the move towards adulthood, becoming wives and mothers. So in Saito's view, the 1970s magical girl was a kind of conservative figure who reaffirms the existing system of marriage and homemaking in Japan's patriarchal society of the 1970s. But Saito also points out in her essay that since the 1990s, a different kind of magical girl has started appearing in Japanese manga and anime, the Sento Bishoujo, or beautiful fighting girl or female battle hero, who is still magical, right? But her transformation no longer requires any physical maturation of her body, right? So you might think of Sailor Moon, right? Uh, Pretty Cure, as someone mentioned earlier, or even Card Captor Sakura, right? When she becomes um, the card captor, she doesn't actually grow up into a more into an older or more mature form of herself. She just dresses up in clothes made by her best friend slash stalker, <laughs> Tomoyo, right? So uh, in Saito's view, this new 1990s magical girls who uh, don't have to undergo a physical transformation, uh, it suggests that magical girls may no longer need uh, the grown-up magic to claim power because they are already powerful as they are. Thus, the 1990s magical girls maximize their power by simply being themselves, end quote. I want to remind us here that Saito's analysis of the magical girl uh, as an ambivalent and contradictory figure is grounded in a specifically Japanese social and cultural context. Even though the 1990s magical girls are, quote, claiming power in powerlessness, their youthfulness and cuteness leaves them open to sexualization and leaves patriarchal power structures intact. But it's also worth noting that outside of Japan, the reception and impact of these 1990s magical girls has generally been more positive. So in the North American context, for example, uh, there has been what, ha uh, what is known as the Sailor Moon Generation, right, which is a term used to describe uh, an entire cohort, an entire batch of women comics creators, mostly millennials, who were inspired by the Sailor Moon anime on TV when the English dubbed version first aired in 1995 in North America. Right. As Catherine Hammond, also a manga scholar, argues in her book, Manga Cultures and the Female Gaze, right? manga like Sailor Moon and Magic Knight Ray Earth express, quote, 
a female gaze that allows readers, readers to see celebrations of empowered femininity in the works that would otherwise be dismissed as misogynistic. And this female gaze can serve as a critical tool for female creators to overturn cliches and narrative patterns and to appeal to an audience of girls and women and also as a means of feminist critique. So as Hammond argues in her book, right, Sailor Moon was very much uh, uh, an anime and a manga that provided positive feminist role models because the Sailor Scouts were female characters not defined by their attachment to men or involvement in romance. And also, right, uh, Hammond singles out Ma uh, Clamp's Magic Knight Ray Earth as another important text, right, uh, that Magic Knight Ray Earth uh, largely conforms to genre, uh, to the magical girl manga genres tropes about gender and sexuality, but Clamp gives these tropes a tragic twist that undermines the tropes. And I want to give a quick summary, right, of of of, of what happens there, because it's important for what we uh, what we're looking at in Dreamwalker. So those of you who know who've read or seen Magic Knight Re Earth will know that. Three Japanese schoolgirls, Hikaru, Fu, and Umi, are summoned into the sword and sorcery world of Sephiro by the world's guardian spirit, another magical girl named Princess Emeraldi, ostensibly to save the world from destruction. So they are ordinary schoolgirls who become magical fighting girls. The twist, however, is that the three girls from Japan end up having to kill Princess Emeraldi, who brought them to the world of Sephiro, because the princess has fallen in love with a man and is no longer totally devoted to her world. And because Princess Emeraldi can't kill herself, she's basically committing suicide by magical girl. Right. So this trope is a common one. Princess Emeraldi, a magical girl herself, is losing her power because of her love and desire for a man. So her lack of purity and devotion to her world is causing Sephiro to fall apart. Um, so the three magical girls from Japan, Hikaru, Fu, and Umi, represent girlish innocence, trust, and the strength of friendship. And the purity of their hearts is what allows them to defeat the uh, more sexually mature and now tainted uh, Princess Emeraldi. But even though the three of them do succeed in killing the princess and saving Sephiro, the ending of the manga is tragic, right? The manga's final splash page, which is the bottom right image, this is the last panel of Magic Knight Ray Earth, of the Magic Knight Ray Earth manga. The three girls are transported back to Japan right after they kill Princess Emeraldi, who you see in the middle, uh, 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 the middle panels. And they're hugging and crying each, uh, they're hugging each other and crying out in shock and anger, saying, it, uh, uh, te nai yo. it cannot end like this. It shouldn't be this way. This can't be how things, th th this can't be the way it should be, right? As Hammond observes, Rayeth adheres to, uh, ad uh, Rayeth the manga adheres to the standard trope in which the magical girl's youth and innocence have defeated maturity and adult sexuality. But the emotional pain caused by the manga's, a manga's refusal to allow closure to the characters or the readers demonstrates the damage caused by this trope from the perspective of a female gaze that sees women as subjects capable of growth and change instead of as mere objects to be discarded or defeated or desired." End quote. So in my own analysis of Dreamwalker, I'm following Catherine Hammond's lead in discussing Yume, the comic's uh, protagonist, in the context of a female gaze and empowered femininity. Uh, Yume is a secondary three student, so she's about 14 to 15 years old, and she starts having strange dreams at the same time as people in her neighborhood start falling into comas or dying in their sleep. Yume, whose name in Japanese literally means dream, discovers that she has the powers of a dreamwalker, right? Someone with the ability to see and enter into other people's dreams and also, uh, also enter a, into a dimension called the dreamscape. Also, skilled and powerful dreamwalkers can create their own pocket dimensions or miniature dreamscapes. And dreamwalkers have the power to fight and defeat dream demons known as Boma. Right, who are born from humanity's dark thoughts and feelings. And these boma devour human souls, causing people to fall into comas and die in their sleep. This is what's going on in the, in, at the beginning of the, uh, of the comic. The bomas may be dream creatures, but they can cause real damage to our physical world. And Yume is mentored in a dreamwalker training by Muka, a talking cat. You can see on the image on the left, right, the final image of the first series, Muka is the top right figure. That's his human form and that's his cat form. He literally is a cat, a talking cat, right? Um, 
Uh, Muka is a talking cat who is uh, Yume's mentor and also a member of a group of elite dreamwalkers called the Five Pillars. Along the way, Yume teams up with two other dreamwalkers, Ken, that's the uh, boy at the bottom right of the panel, um, who, is, who is also her classmate from school. He's an avid gamer, a cosplayer and self-taught dreamwalker. Belle, uh, the little girl in the top left, who is uh, actually Yume's antagonist in the first story arc, right? And after Yume and Ken defeat Belle, we learn that Belle was manipulated by a powerful extreme walker named Shuang Yue, who is the antagonist of the second story arc of the first series. So you may notice some things about Yume as a character. First, Yume's curly hair gives her the appearance of having cat ears or neko mimi, right? So her ordinary everyday appearance is already unusually cute or kawaii. Also, when Yume activates her dreamwalker powers, she does not go through a metamorphosis or transformation into a more physically adult form. So this aligns Yume with the uh, magical girls from the 1990s who also don't have a metamorphosis, don't henshin, right? They don't change their bodies. Uh, these beautiful fighting girls are already powerful as they are and maximize their power by simply being themselves. But what I think is the clearest link between Yume and a longer lineage of magical girls is her dreamwalker weapon. When she begins as a novice dreamwalker, she's using two uh, twin rods or staves given to her by her mentor, Muka. However, in the second story arc, she gains her own dreamwalker weapons, right? She levels up, gets a power up, also gets a gear up. And she has two new weapons, two elegant and ornately uh, designed swords. The design of Yume's sword, this is the two panels in the bottom right of the slide, right? The design of Yume's sword, especially the ornate cross guard uh, um, uh, between the blade and the hilt, reminds us of Hikaru's sword, the Escudo upgraded version, right, from Magic Knight Ray Earth, which you can see as the color image on the bottom right. right? Notice the similar semicircular shape and ornate design of the cross guard of Hikaru's sword. And finally, what allows me to discuss Dreamwalker uh, uh, in relation to Singapore are the illusions or the uh, sort of references to Singapore that occur in the background. And I mean this literally, right? Some of the background panels, which you can see on the slide, depict faded grayscale panoramic uh, illustrations of common scenes of streets and roads and HDB buildings, right, in Singapore. And in the exposition section of, this, of, the, of the comic, the characters, uh, characters are reading a newspaper called Sing Paper, which you can see in the bottom right panel, right? The newspaper is called Sing Paper. So it's safe to say that the baseline world or reality of the comic is Singapore, or at least a kind of dreamlike version of the Singapore that we know. So in the Singapore context, how might we understand Yume as an empowered feminine figure? So, when we think about popular image of women in Singapore, various figures might come to mind. For example, as you can see on the slide, there's the Singapore girl, the Sarong Party girl, the Alien, the Xiao Mei Mei, and probably several others. And these names carry with them different degrees of praise and approval. Right. Uh, furthermore, as scholars have shown in the three essays I have listed on the slide, uh, in popular discourse, women in Singapore who go into politics or who work in STEM professions or STEM fields or who are depicted in TV uh, advertisements are still often regarded as wives or mothers or family or domestic caregivers or, especially in the case of the TV commercials, valued for their physical looks and sex appeal. But as Chris Hudson points out in his book, Beyond the Singapore Girl, Discourses of Gender and Nation in Singapore, right? Women are, are, are also able to create counter narratives that have disturbed the certainty of gender difference and the expectation that they should cultivate themselves as national and family subjects. The pedagogy, the pedagogy of nation has been ruptured by the performativity of women, Hudson argues in his book. What this means, let me translate, what this means is that a protagonist like Yume in Dreamwalker can be read as refusing prescribed gender roles in a performative manner, which means she doesn't have to directly challenge or criticize these prescribed gender roles in order to break away from them. She simply needs to perform her difference. Uh, so take, for example, the notion that women's primary, primary role is to create and nurture their families to ensure the nation's biological production, right? Uh, it turns out that Yume 
uh, doesn't come from a standard nuclear family. Her mother, Scarlett, is absent in the present time of the comic. Uh, we, we don't know if she's dead or missing. And her father, Yu Ying, is away on business most of the time. And it turns out that her entire family uh, are also dream walkers, right? Her mother, her father, and then her cousin, Yuka, are also dream walkers. So Yume, like her other family members, is drawn to a different purpose than simply uh, ensuring the nation's reproductive future. And this is highlighted most clearly when Yume makes the fateful decision to become a dreamwalker in the sort of exposition section of the comic, right? Like many other magical girls in manga, Yume is fighting to protect those who are nearest and dearest to her. But if you look at the image on the left, you'll notice that the nearest and dearest are not Yume's family members, but rather her classmates, right? Yume in the, in the right-hand panel, the grayscale panel, uh, uh, the, the three people she's thinking of are the faces of her three friends from school, Janice, Kirin, and Erika. And if you look at the image on the right uh, of the slide, when Yume is fighting a powerful opponent, what triggers her growth and advancement as a dream walker are her care and concern for her best friend since childhood, Erika. We can see the faces of Erika in the middle panel, right? Uh, uh, those are Erika's faces that Yume is thinking of. So for Yume, what matters most to her are French, uh, friendships with Erika and her classmates, and that's what she's fighting for. In addition, right, it's her intense concern for another girl, her best friend Erika, that make her more powerful as a dream walker, which further pushes Yume away from a kind of heterosexual and heteronormative coupling. And this doesn't mean that Yume you know, does not care about her family members. I think it suggests that Yume doesn't subscribe to the national imperative of women putting their family, their family and biological reproduction first and foremost. And this brings me to another point about Yume's innocence and purity. By this, I'm referring to some of the tropes uh, mentioned by Saito Kumiko uh, in, the essay, in her essay about magical girls in anime and manga, right? which is that magical girls have to give up their magical powers as they move uh, towards adulthood, and that adult female sexuality is a kind of danger or threat that the magical girl's innocence and purity must defeat because she doesn't yet know love or desire. Now, Dreamwalker does appear to stay true to the second trope. And the example I'm raising here is the fight between Yume and uh, Marine, right? This girl on the left who is wearing dark clothes and wearing a black scythe. So if you look at Marine's physical appearance, right? She's wearing a crop top, right? Shorts and knee length high boots. In contrast to Yume, uh, to, in contrast to Yume, Ma Marine is showing a lot more skin. Right, and her long black hair accentuates right, her, uh, uh, her sexuality. Unsurprisingly, uh, Yume does defeat Marine, right, breaking Marine's scythe when she finds new strength and power within herself. And we find that Marine is working for an extreme walker named Shuangyue, who is on the right the right-hand side of the slide. And Shuangyue has been possessed by, a, uh, possessed by a powerful red dream demon and is controlling Shuangyue in order to try and eat or devour Yume's soul to become even more powerful. A desire that I think it's fair to say has sexual overtones to it. So Marine's sexy uh, appearance and revealing attire are connected to her boss's demonic corruption. And at this level, the comic does seem to affirm the standard manga trope, whereby the magical girl's innocence is needed to defeat uh, a character with more assertive sexuality, like Marine. But another way of reading this is to see Marine's sexiness as a symptom or manifestation of the red dream demon's corruption and the dream demon itself, right? If we remember, the dream demon is a manifestation of human negativity and desires. Yume's innocence might represent a turn away from sex and lust as a way of relating to others, right, of not sexually and objectifying and lusting after other people. Instead, Yume's innocence allows her to empathize with and better understand with what other people are thinking and feeling. And this can be seen during Yume's climactic, uh, climactic battle with the demon-possessed Shuangyue. Uh, as you can see on the top left, Yume receives a wound that would normally be mortal, that would normally be fatal when she's impaled by Shuangyue, who has transformed his arm into a demonic spear. Again, I think we can't avoid right, the sort of sexual connotations when we see such a dramatic piercing or penetration of a young girl's body. But instead of killing Yume, this deep wound right, allows her to enter into Shuangyue's memories of being a dreamwalker and falling in love with her cousin Yuka, 
And it turns out that Shuang Yue lost his right eye, protecting Yuka from, a, from the Red Dream Demon's attack. And the eye injury is what allowed the demon to possess and corrupt him. So by witnessing these memories, which you can see in the bottom left uh, panel, right? by witnessing these memories, Yumei is able to awaken Shuang Yue's original self that had been repressed by the demon. And she's then able to channel her own power through the arm that's impaling her to exorcise or cast the demon out of Shuang Yue. Right. So she's, she turned a terrible wound into a kind of tactical advantage right, to defeat the dream demon possessing uh, her uh, uh, Shuang Yue, the former dream walker. And my point in discussing this event is to highlight how is to highlight how we might move beyond looking at the Yume versus Marine fight as a, a kind of sexuality endangering innocence of purity, which is the standard magical girl trope, right? For Dreamwalker, I think we can similarly flip the, flip the trope in a way that Catherine Hammond did when she analyzed Magic Knight Ray Earth. Uh, and to see Yume's innocence and purity as what allows her to empathize and to help her understand other people. In fact, if you look back at the uh, middle image on this slide, which I went back to, uh, you, Marine and Yume in the middle panel are depicted as fighting in profile. What at first appears to be an opposition of dark versus light might actually be a kind of yin and yang configuration with the curvature, right, the curved line of Marine's scythe at the top, suggesting a kind of circular shape right, uh, uh, joining the two girls together, a kind of complementary yin and yang circle uh, uh, joining both girls so that they are complementary rather than opposed figures and forces. So the last point, okay, I'll try and hurry up a bit. Uh, the last point I want to bring up about Dreamwalker can, uh, is that this comic can be read in, also read in light of a 2018 documentary by Channel News Asia about class differences and socioeconomic inequality in Singapore. So I won't dwell on this because you probably are more familiar with this than I am, right? Suffice to say that this documentary, you know, uh, focused on a group of students, secondary school students, right, aged 15 to 17 from different educational streams or tracks. There was a kind of backlash against the uh, Karina, who is the uh, integrated program or IP student, for ap apparently saying or, or appearing to say some very snobbish or elitist things. But then Grace Yo, writing for Rice Media, did a deeper delve right into the documentary and contacted some of the participants in the conversation and found that they actually were saying a lot more about, say, you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, right, rather than having a sort of mixed classrooms about how uh, uh, different groups of students or people from different educational streams were socializing outside of school, right, rather than focusing on the school as an environment where they were supposed to mix. So there was a lot left out of this official CNA documentary that didn't get put into uh, uh, what we saw. So I encourage you to have a look at the documentary itself and also look at Gracio's article on Rice Media. My point, right, in uh, linking the, um, in linking this uh, uh, in, in linking this documentary and the so subsequent discussion to Dreamwalker is that Yume is a typical magical, uh, uh, um, a magical girl manga protagonist who is a below average student, right? She's arguably in the normal stream because she has difficulty even passing her academic subjects and has to take makeup exams, as you can see on the slides on the, uh, the slide on the left, uh, the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, this, of course, causes Yume a lot of stress. But her schoolmates and friends, both new and old, rally around to help her pass her makeup exams. And it's important to note here that Erika, Yume's best friend from childhood, is, uh, uh, is, is uh, trying to be a model student. She's uh, the school's head prefect, uh, prefect or president of the student council and studies very hard. And that's what causes her a lot of stress that develops into a separate storyline later on. Also important is Yume's relationship with Ken, her male classmate who also turns out to be a dream walker, right? And he is a typical slacker genius. He plays lots of video games, plays truant and skips many classes, but somehow aces and gets A's on all his exams and subjects. Right? So in Yume's circle of friends and schoolmates, there are students with different abilities, arguably from different streams or tracks, who have come together to help her. And you know, thanks to their peer mentoring efforts, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, she's able to pass her exams and able to take part in the campus festival. I mean, all this for plot purposes, this is all there to set up some important Dreamwalker-related events. But the kind of socialization, right, the mixing of different 
students of different academic abilities is, I think, you know, representative of what was left out of the Channel News Asia documentary, where it seemed as if the Express and IP students were kind of disdainful or looking down at the normal stream students in the documentary. Okay. And one other thing I want to bring up about Ken, not only is he a slacker genius at school, he's also naturally gifted and talented as a self-taught dream walker. Uh, he's able to transform his own bracelet into a dream walker uh, a weapon. And not surprisingly, this gives Yumi an inferiority complex because Ken seems to surpass her effort. Uh, effortlessly. So she's doubly ashamed because she can't be as good as Ken either at school or in the dreamscape, right? However, by overcoming her inferiority complex and realizing her own talents as a dreamwalker, right, and we can see her going through this mental process on the slides that I presented on this, uh, uh, on, the, on the panels I presented on this slide, right? By overcoming her uh, her inferiority and realizing her own skills and talents, you may no longer judges herself by Ken's standards, whether as a student or as a dreamwalker, and starts regarding him as a trustworthy companion, right, even though he can be irritating at times. So to go back to Catherine Hammond's idea of reading manga with a female gaze by centering female characters, we might say that you may both as a magical girl and as a secondary school girl, no longer needs to live up to her male classmates, uh, Ken's achievements or standards. You may see and is, is seen by Ken as an equal on their dream walker team and doesn't regard him as a potential love interest. And this is an important point because it's different from another famous magical manga, magical girl manga that uh, some of you mentioned earlier, Can't Kept the Sakura, right? Where if you remember, Sakura's male classmate, uh, Lee Xiaoran, starts out as Sakura's rival, but then becomes her friend and her teammate. And eventually the two of them become a romantic couple. So in Dreamwalker, Ken is eventually romant romantically paired, not with Yumei, but with Yumei's best friend, Erika, right? So to read Yumei's growth and self-confidence in terms of Chris Hudson's analysis of women and gender roles in Singapore, we might say that Yumei has emerged as a bad subject who does not or cannot follow the standard script of academic success in Singapore. She's literally bad at all her school subjects, but she has the power and skill in the dreamscape and such power cannot be measured by the usual quantitative metrics of academic achievement. As a magical girl, Yume in Dreamwalker performs what Chris Hudson calls the feminine escaping the paternal logic of the state and disrupting the masculine and thus bringing into existence the crisis of representation of the gendered nation. What this means is that as a feminine representation or figure, you made the magical girl, the Maho Shoujo, departs or breaks away from the sexualization and commodification of the male gaze we see in some of the other popular images of Singaporean women I mentioned earlier in this talk. The Singapore girl, right, the Sarong Party girl, and the Xiao Mei Mei. So I'm going to conclude very briefly. Uh, to use Jacqueline Burns' terms, I hope I've shown how affirmative aspects of how uh, of Dreamwalker of how Dreamwalker performs as a kind of manga esque text by highlighting how the comic engages with issues of gender and class through the tropes of magical girl manga, but also tweaks or modifies these manga tropes to produce representational inconsistencies. And these inconsist uh, inconsistencies in turn invite readers to think more or more deeply about issues of gender, class, and representation in Singapore today. Thank you very much.